this is going to be a nightmare. I'm not keen. Right, let's look at this radio here. This is a Sony Airband radio. It'd be nice to look at this thing. Apparently it doesn't work. Apparently it was someone's father's, like their father's dead or something. They want to get it working again or have it for posterity, I'm guessing. Interesting knobs on these. I'm going to pop it in out. I haven't listened to this at all yet. I don't know what the story is with it. Let's start with the battery pack, because this is the most likely thing to be wrong. And yet there are batteries in it. Let's have a look inside, see what they actually look like. This is an interesting pack. How does this go together? There's batteries in the bottom, but I can't see how to get them out. Oh, there we go. It slides out. Here's my cat. The last surviving cat. She's 20 years old. Do you want to do a cat scan? No? What do you mean it's knackered? A bit of corrosion in there. Just a little bit. Looks like it's been cleaned up already though. It's not looking too bad there. That yeah, looks right. And that end looks kind of okay. So it's just a little bit just on this one here. So I don't think that's going to be a problem. I might just chuck a bit of vinegar on it anyway. Let's just spray a bit of vinegar on this because there's a little bit of corrosion just on one bit. Yeah, that's bubbling away. So there's definitely something going on there. It's not much, it's just a tiny little bit. Almost insignificant. But you never quite know. You all the simple things out first. When it comes to battery powered devices, it's off to the battery, which is the problem. Flush it with IPA. Just check the actual batteries, see what they look like. And that's good. 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 And good. So that pack should work when we put the batteries in. Let's check the terminals, make sure we've got a voltage on the end. 6.2 volts. Yep, that's fine. Let's actually see if maybe it's the way they put the pack in. Now let's look at the other side of it. Let's look at the radio. The radio's got these terminals in there, which aren't too bad, but it looks like there's a little bit of corrosion on those as well, or a bit of dirt. We shall give those a clean up as well, and just to be sure. Then we'll try it again. I'll put the back back in again. We'll power it up. And we have power. Now, question is, does it work? No sound knock on here. There's no scratch. That's on FM. So I would be expecting to hear something. AM? Nothing. So is that the fault? There's no sound. Possibly. I've got no idea how to use this thing, but we'll figure it out. I have an IF signal generator. It's powered up. So I've got my signal generator hooked up to this thing. I'm injecting a 76 megahertz, a minus 73 dBm signal, which should be strong enough for me to pick up, and with 10 kilohertz modulation. There's nothing there. Absolutely no sound whatsoever. It's also got like a receive indicator, I'm guessing, but there's nothing lining up. So is it actually dead? Is there no receiver? In fact, I'm not hearing anything at all. It could be no audio, it could be an audio issue, right? Things like headphone jacks are a common failure because those little contacts get weakened and they stay open. Especially if you've had a headphone plugged in a lot, they'll tend to stay open and they won't actually close and re-enable an internal speaker. We can verify that by plugging a headphone in or earphone. But it looks like there should be a receiver indicator looking at this, but there's nothing showing up. Scan. Oh, that made a sound. Oh, I heard something then. Just very briefly, I heard something. Right, so there is something going on here. The speaker is working. I can hear it ticking as it's scrolling through. So I've got a 76 megahertz signal, so I should stop at 76 megahertz when it gets there. Because there is a signal there. That beep is when it gets around to the end of frequencies. Carry frequency, 100 megahertz. Now I'm straight past it. So it's not receiving anything. Receiver is dead. That could be problematic then, couldn't it? This is looking a bit more involved than I want it to be. Alright, let's open this thing up and have a look inside. See how hard it is to have a look. But there is sound, but there's just no reception. Okay, you're in. Well, this is old technology, isn't it? This is 80s, 80s kind of construction. Maybe even into the 90s, I'm not sure. There's a mess around there. Is that just glue? Probably put it onto those trimmers to keep them stabilised so they don't move. This is the receiver board. The antenna goes into this board. So this is all the filtering, IFs, and that sort of stuff. It's all going to be in here. There's an AF connection just there. Some of these things are labelled, which is nice. Now, obviously, you've got the control board underneath it sandwiched down there. 
I'm not quite sure how hard it is to separate all these things because these are usually pretty crammed in there. So hopefully no one's been in playing with adjustments because that'd be a bit of a nightmare. But I'm just going to do a little visual thing right now. Let's look around so I can see anything which looks bad. So some glues which are used in older gear, a bit like the glue that's actually here. You've got this brown glue like this. This glue ends up being corrosive after a while. It also starts to conduct. It becomes conductive and corrosive. So if there's much of this stuff laying around, it could be a problem. But it's always this one. But this one's actually looking kind of okay. It's still quite soft. So I expect that the rest of it's all fine. You know, the fact that this is still soft and the light brown means it's probably all right still. But what I'm looking at is the glue over here, which isn't the same glue, but I just want to check it anyway. Let's see if we get any conduction here. Even the probe's really close. No, it's not conducting. Let's check the brown glue. So because it still looks really good, I don't think it's going to be conducting. That's looking fine right now. Yeah, the brown glue is not conducting yet, which is a good sign. It means it's actually in reasonably good shape. So I'm trying to get to the PLO board because that seems to be where the, there's a DC switching supply, which I want to test. But trying to get to it is a nightmare. It's sandwiched in the middle of all this stuff somewhere. This isn't looking like much fun, I have to say. I was hoping I could lift that board off, but that's not going to work. So I lifted the whole thing out. There's two screws lifted this whole chassis out. There's a screw here, there's a screw there, which go through the casing. Rubicons from this era, they are often bad. This age Rubicon is usually problematic. I've seen them many times in CBs where those, they're just dead, completely dead. <sighs> this is going to be a nightmare. I'm not keen. At the moment I'm kind of debating how far I go with this thing and how easy it is going to be to fix. I mean, it's a sandwiched apart, but the sandwich came apart there. That's not too bad. It's quite good. Interesting, there's a couple of LEDs down here, which are normally not visible. So those might be diagnostic LEDs. But there's lots of capacitors in here, loads and loads of capacitors, and all small capacitors, right? Generally, the smaller capacitor, the more likely to fail. I'm not at all confident about this at all. Just this kind of radio is just not nice to work on. Let's try some caps first. Let's do the easy stuff. One point seven ohm. That's right for that size. Three ohms. Yeah, probably all right. Point three ohms. That looks all right. Well, I'm not seeing any capacitors which are obviously really bad because that would be easy, but it actually makes the situation worse. 0.68. Let's power this up, see if these LEDs do anything. What could possibly go wrong with all these bits of metal casing floating around? You have power. LEDs, got nothing going on. That's one of the scan buttons. LEDs, nothing. What to do, what to do? more complicated than I want it to be. So I'm just probing the input of IC1 which is an IF input here with my scope and I'm getting 1.4 volts as specified in the manual for it but I'm getting no audio or any other kind of signs of life. Changing modes you expect to see a difference happening somewhere and I'm seeing nothing happening. Um, I'm not seeing any kind of waveform which would indicate life so it seems at that point it's dead already. Well, I'm going to try injecting a signal, which should be an RF signal, into this point, and we'll see if anything happens. But nothing there. Nothing at all. No sound. Scorch is definitely down. Nothing present. So let's look at the rest of the RF path and see if I can inject it a bit later on, so I'll make it come up that way. Let's try pin one of IC2 because that's further in the path. Still nothing present. Nothing at all. This like is completely dead. So the scorch control. Can you see the light flickering there? As I push that in and out. And now I can actually hear a bit of noise in there in the sometimes. So it looks like that is actually a switch for Auto a manual scorch. Now let's inject a signal. This is a 10.7 kilohertz signal into pin 1. See the light come on? So there is something there. This one of controls knackered. There we go, there it is.
It's bad switches. It does appear to be these controls. I've got a problem with working right now, but it's really erratic. So this is injecting 76 megahertz for my signal generator, so that should be working correctly. Um, but this is really glitchy. These pots appear to be bad. Right? Yeah. That's the problem. Hmm. I think the pots might be beyond fixing. We'll see. So I pulled the adjustments out here. These pots. Sticker board looks fine. I can't see any signs of cat joints in the light. There's nothing obviously bad there. So I don't think that's a problem. I don't think it was that. So I'll just try putting in another pot. We'll see what happens with this when I turn the power on. Right, don't short anything out. Power is on. Oh, sounds like it works to me. Even though the resistance is greatly bigger. Because the original pot was a 20k, this is a 50k. And it works. So I can do the same thing on the squelch pot. If it physically fits, that's the other thing I've got to check, is actually put it in place, drop into the casing, and make sure that the, the pot actually sticks up far enough and actually put a knob onto it and actually be able to use it. Okay, and that's what I need to check next. Alright, is this good enough? That's where that sits, and it's just like only barely anything there. That's pushed right down. That's not really enough to grab hold of. Knobs. Do I have something here I can use? This is quite a long standoff than this one, <laughs> but it's somewhat ugly. That's the next problem is I need a pair of them. Well, I found these ones which are a little bit ugly. They will just fit, they've got a big standoff on them. I might have to trim the shaft down very slightly to get it so it sits down nice enough. But I think these are doable. I think these will work. So I've got a choice of one. <laughs> I think that's what I'm going to have to use instead of using the original knobs. Swap them out to these ugly things. But at least then it will be fixed. That's the only solution I can come up with right now. The old ice squelch on this is switching between a pair of fixed resistors and the pot. So the old squelch isn't really an old squelch, it's just a, a preset squelch level. A bit fake really. So it's not so critical. It would be nice to be able to do some kind of old squelch. I do have a switch, but it's only a single switch. It's only a single throw, and it's only thrown on when you turn it on. So I'm going to have to think about if there's a way I can actually wire this up to make this some kind of auto squelch system similar to what it's already got, auto squelch, or whether I just have to completely abandon your squelch idea and just have a manual squelch only, which is a valid thing to do too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this switch to short across this resistor here. What I'm going to do effectively is put this resistor in series with the pot. So when the pot's in a zero position, that's like zero ohms one side, 50k the other. If I put this resistor, which is 47k, in series with the pot in its last position, which it would be when the switch is off, so the switch is open, they would be putting that resistor in series with the pot, which effectively put the pot in about halfway position. Right? So it's like having the switch halfway up manually. That's what it would be effectively doing. And as soon as you turn the pot to turn the switch off, they will put it right at the bottom of the range, and then you've got a full range on the pot manually. So I think that's what I need to do, is modify this. I've already taken a little melf resistor off here, I will cut the track there, and then I've got to put the switch contacts there across that resistor there, and then link this center, the common the wiper, I suppose, of the pot to the original position, which is over here. Right, that kind of connected there. So I'll go a link from there to there, and bridge that switch contact across that resistor, and that should probably work. Probably. So now I've linked them together a little bit. Kind of cleaned up, still a little bit dirty, but it's. <laughs> Probably better than it was on factory actually. I put some links across. I was going to check to make sure there's no shorts anywhere. Anything that shouldn't be going to where it shouldn't be going. And if it's all good, then I can do something to protect these cables and these little loops. Make sure there's nothing shorting, you know, like liquid electrical tape. Put a bit of that on there to secure it all. And I can put it together. And it will probably work. Hopefully. I've started reassembling it. It's not back fully together yet. I've just got the thing back into the front casing. Let's try it out and see if these knobs actually work. Obviously they're recessed right now. I've got knobs on them. Turn the power on. There's power. We have volume. That's good. Now turn the scorch up. It's all the way up. It's reduced signal level till it cuts out. Okay, it's 100 dBm. There you go, scorch is working. Let's try auto scorch. Auto scorch. Let's drop it down some more. 
minus 110. Nah. Yeah, all that scorch isn't scorching. It's too much for it. So all that scorch isn't actually doing enough. That's a shame. You got no more scorch. That'll do. That's good enough for me. I decided not to use those other knobs. I found some other ones that actually fit in these holes quite well. They're not perfect. They do go below the surface more than I'd like, but they are actually going to do the job really nicely. So I think I'm going to use these ones. That's much nicer. Wow, this has been a mission fixing this thing. <laughs> Antennas on it. Radio. Pick up the radio. It's working. Can't do it for too long, otherwise I get a copyright strike or something. It works. Brilliant. That was a mission. Well, that's fixed, it seems. Seems to be working alright. You know, the knobs are not ideal, but they'll work. Do the job. Got a couple of bits here. Maybe I'll research these and find out more about them. Maybe I should get something a bit like this to have something stock, or at least something with a longer shaft. So next time I get something like this, I'll actually have parts which I can use that and to bodge something in, make it work. Um, I like to have a assortment of things to make it possible. But anyway, I was quite happy that I was able to get that sorted out. So I'll check out the other videos down below, other repairs and things like that. Subscribe if you haven't already subscribed, if you haven't been here before especially. And Patreon support link over there. If you want to support me on Patreon, help me to buy things to the channel like, I don't know, maybe a assortment of pots which I can use. Okay.